Hello friends and family and welcome to our boring meditation stuff for September 23rd. This is the third video in a sort of series discussing tribes differentiation and um, now with this video the idea of tenacity and I'm a little hesitant to produce this video at all. I realize it's a fairly narrow audience, but um, I feel that I should be quite careful about what I say regarding this topic. Um, the previous two videos discussed the idea um, that there are tribes and that a valuable meditative practice is accessible to all tribes, all people, regardless of where you're from, what you believe, what language you speak. Um, this is sort of a fundamental property of a meditation, a universal meditation, um, and that that meditation can't, it can't belong to a particular religion, it can't be a Buddhist meditation or a Hindu meditation or a Christian meditation. The second idea is a bit more complex. Uh, it's this idea that we can start to, for ourselves, not externally, disintegrate these tribes and that we can start to see the commonality between them and the shared nature of the individuals within those tribes through meditation, which is a thing that needs to be seen experientially. It can't really be explained. Um, if a person explains it, it just becomes a philosophy like any other. You could read a book about it um, and not bother meditating. This third video, at the end, I will link to two videos. One is from the United States. The United States is experiencing difficulty, or one might say, perhaps more accurately, the United States is shining a light on difficulty that it's experienced for a long time. And the other video is from Kerala, from the opposite side of the planet. And it's a music video by an artist who is trying to shine a light on very similar issues. Issues caused by tribes. Those issues are discrimination, oppression, subjugation of whole populations. Why, why is this relevant to meditation? <laughs> It may not seem immediately obvious. If you, as the viewer of this video, ever choose to take a 10-day Vipassana course, toward the end of the course, uh, one of the last lectures, um, SN Cuenca, as the, the teacher of the meditation, gives the students, discusses the world outside of meditation. What does meditation do for you, really? And his words are something to the effect of meditation does not make you a vegetable. <laughs> you, uh, you don't just sit there and let anything happen to you. But more importantly, you don't just sit there and let anything happen to others. Um, and there's an example given within the course um, of someone harming another person. So you're a third party, and the first party and the second party, one is harming the other, or perhaps they're both harming each other. And as a third party, you have a societal responsibility to get involved, to prevent the harm from being done. And in that particular lecture, I believe that's on the eighth day, 
I don't quote me on that. He discusses the nature of your intention as someone who is trying to serve those other people. Um, how do you want to help and why do you want to help and what do you feel in helping? And this idea is one of compassion that we need to be compassionate not only to the victim but to the aggressor and that's very very difficult um, in an immediate situation <laughs> and it's even more difficult in an abstract situation one like the, the United States is currently experiencing one like the populations addressed in the music video in Kerala is addressing. And this video is not actually about that. It's not about compassion for the aggressor. Um, that's not a topic I'm comfortable discussing. It's a complicated topic and it's a topic that's better addressed um, in the course of serious meditation. There's a reason it shows up on, on day eight, if I'm right about that day, um, in a 10-day Vipassana course. Um, but this idea of serving society that we owe, we owe a huge debt, <laughs> every one of us, we owe our parents and our family a huge debt for everything that they've provided us all the opportunities all the comforts all the safety but we also owe society for these same things um, our societies are built up in such a way that they provide structures for safety and support and the sorts of discrimination and harm which come on these large scales from one tribe to another tribe, um, however you draw the lines between the tribes, those are also structures in the same way that we have employment insurance and um, life insurance and hospitals and nurses, um, government institutions, libraries, which very visibly and structurally support the community, the structures of oppression are often invisible, complicated, and embedded among every participant of society. Undoing these structures is it's not a, a movement, it's not an event. Um, we always prefer, <laughs> all of us would prefer a sort of Marvel movie conclusion to any of these sorts of problems. We, we want the good guys to overcome the bad guys and for there to be uh, a positive, healthy, wholesome outcome. But the Marvel movie lasts decades and decades and centuries and centuries. And the movement is forever forward. So there is a requirement not for superheroes, but for tenacity. And the reason I hesitate to produce this video is because uh, it doesn't take much imagination um, on the part of a viewer. I mean, my friends and family, close friends and family, if that's who you happen to be watching this, <laughs> you know already. You know that I, I come from a very privileged background and I come from a very um, comfortable background. Um, in uh, I'm 
I don't mean that in any sort of negative sense. Uh, I think that the goal of the global attempts to disassemble these sorts of structures which harm people, the goal is to give everyone that kind of comfort, everyone that kind of safety, everyone those kinds of privileges. Um, the goal isn't to break down the people who already have this privilege, um, who already have a certain measure of safety. That's counterproductive. <laughs> but um, it is difficult for me, as someone coming from one of those positions, to say, oh, okay, well, let me lead the charge. Let me be a big important figure in this long and complex equation of untethering these systemic and, and structural issues across a global society because the problems are not limited to the United States, the problems are not limited to the borders of Kerala, the problems are global inherently global and they encompass all of humanity all at once and in the acute case in the case described on the eighth day of Vipassana course the example is fairly straightforward one person is hurting another person and you intervene it is your responsibility to do so, and you would be failing those two people were you to not intervene. That would be a failure on your part. When we extrapolate that situation into a structural, global, complex set of systems which we are trying to dismantle and rebuild into something which is not harmful and which is in fact positive for all people. It is difficult to say that we have abandoned our responsibility and it's easy to feel guilty. <laughs> it's easy to feel guilty. Oh, I haven't solved racism. Oh, I haven't solved casteism. <laughs> Um, these, these problems will not be solved within our lifetime and similar problems will always exist. So it's important for us to remember this idea of tenacity and also our small role. And I actually like the dictionary definition of tenacity. The dictionary definition of tenacity refers to the constant grip, that you constantly have a grip on whatever it is that you're tenacious about. And a person needs to choose the causes one wishes to work on and to find resolution for incrementally, progressively, iteratively, and over a long period of time. Tenacity, in this context, is not easy. It is very easy for us to get dissuaded. It is very easy for us to become complacent. I think that North America, but the United States in particular, has allowed this sort of complacency. There is a sense that well, racism is solved. And there's a similar sense in, in India. Here in India, um, it's surprising how often you will meet someone usually educated um, and usually coming from a higher caste, whether they know it or not who believes that casteism is, is gone, it's more or less gone. <laughs> it's just in the rural areas that there's casteism anymore. Um, casteism 
religious discrimination, racism, these things are in each of us. They are a part of everything you read. They are a part of everything that you do. Gender discrimination, similarly, though gender discrimination is at least easier to see, if the less harmful. This tenacity that is required of every person who is trying to do positive work, who is trying to, on a, on a grand scale, separate these two people who are hurting each other, this tenacity has to come from somewhere. Complacency and exhaustion are natural consequences of working on difficult problems. And if a person simply feels angry and tired all the time, eventually that person will burn out. They will no longer be able to work on the problem, to solve the problem. And someone else will come along at some point and they will pick up where that first person left off. But it would be much more effective for all of us to retain the energy, the tenacity, not to lose our grip on the work that we are doing, whatever that work may be. It is surprising to find the extent to which meditation enables this. Anapana meditation to a fairly small extent. It helps you focus. It helps you concentrate. It helps you avoid tumbling into this um, emotional uh, cave of self-pity and guilt and um, anger and frustration and exhaustion. Vipassana meditation actually gives a person a real sense of energy. It often feels like a kind of energy that a person hasn't been familiar with for a lot of years. If you watch small children, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, they seem to have this infinite energy. How are they so energetic? <laughs> they're bouncing around, they're excited about everything. And by the end of the day, they're tired and they sleep. And when they wake up, they have all this energy again. And this is akin to the kind of energy that a person will see in Vipassana meditation. You'll get a glimpse with one 10 day course. You will get a much better sense of how a person's energy is influenced by watching someone who has been practicing for a very long time. There's one very senior teacher from Northeast India, whom we had an opportunity to meet and to volunteer with. She was teaching a course last year. She, she was 92 or 93 years old, and she would work from <laughs> four in the morning to 10 o'clock at night every day, constantly, with almost no rest. And she has been practicing Vipassana meditation for a very long time. This is the sort of energy that it gives someone who's been practicing it for a very long time. Uh, as someone who's been practicing it for a very short period of time, relatively, um, I can still say that it gives me quite a bit of energy. It gives me resolve. It makes me diligent. 
and it gives me that kind of tenacity that I require for whatever small, more or less insignificant tasks I'm trying to tackle from one day to the next. Um, it prevents me from getting caught up in guilt and hopelessness and exhaustion regarding the causes that I consider very important. I think that uh, the little goodbye that I say every day in these videos to the people I know, um, it's worth noting that when I say taking care of yourself, this is, this is the center, right? You are always at the center. There's no, <laughs> there's nowhere else to go. You can't really escape, unfortunately. Um, and so you have to take care of yourself first. There's, there's really no way around that. And that's why I say, I hope you're taking care of yourself in the same way that I hope that I keep taking care of myself. And then when I say, I hope you're taking care of those around you, this is a set of concentric circles, right? The, f the first people around you are, they are your grandchildren, they are your neighbors, they are your immediate family, they're your parents, they are the members of your nearest tribes smallest tribes, but with each circle, as you work your way out, you get to your community, you get to your city, you get to your country, and you eventually get to all of humanity. Those are the people around you, and those are the people we need to take care of once we feel we are equipped once we feel that we have taken sufficient care of ourselves. There are many different ways to take care of the people around us. And of course, when we find that we are, we're falling down, <laughs> we're failing, um, we, should, we should reduce the scope, right? There are people who really literally kill themselves trying to help others. And, and that is also, counterproductive. We, we shouldn't push so hard that everything near to us collapses. Um, and it's okay. It's okay to dial these down, down to an individual level, down, down to ourselves, if need be, for as long as required, so that we are healthy again. And then we can grow these circles and take care of more people around us whatever taking care <laughs> means, whether that's stopping violence, whether that is helping someone with clarity, whether that is to feed someone, provide someone with clothing, help someone just with a careful and attentive listening ear. Or if it's marching in the streets, if it's volunteering for your government, whatever these tasks are for you as an individual, I hope that you are taking good care of yourself so that you are able to do your tasks. And I hope that as you are able to do that, that you are taking care of everyone around you. And as you take care of everyone around you, they will better be able to do their tasks also. It's a, it's a positive feedback loop. <laughs> um, I will link to these two videos now. Uh, they are significant, both of them, and they are 
um, perhaps a good way to describe it is to say that they are bigger than me and I sincerely hope that I'm not doing anyone a disrespect that I am not crossing a line that I should not be in referencing them in this video. Take care, everyone. I will talk to you tomorrow.